Access more. And I actually had said no several times before accepting it, mm-hmm. but God kept putting it back on my plate saying that this couldn't work out because of this. And God was like, yep, okay, we fixed that. Well, but I can't because of this. And then that was fixed. And it was like, oh, okay, God, you keep opening this door. Like you're clearly asking me to step into it. Welcome to the Candace Cameron Bure podcast. We're here to share conversations about life's challenges, celebrations, and everything in between. Season two is about finding purpose. Come join us. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Candace Cameron Bure podcast. I'm Candace, and joined with Heather McFadden. And this season, we're talking about finding our purpose. Before we jump in, I want you to know Access More is the preferred place to listen to and watch my podcast. At accessmore.com, you can find other great faith-based podcasts on audio and video. Just go to accessmore.com. You know, Heather, I wrote a book uh, eight or nine years ago called Balancing It All, which was... I think the secondary title was My Life, My Purpose and Priorities or something like that. I don't remember. I wrote it a long time ago, (laughs) but it had the themes of purpose in it. Mm -hmm. And you have a book coming out called Right Where You Are. And um, so this season, we're talking about your book and all the themes in it. And today's podcast is going to be specifically about humbled success and the definition of humility to fully occupy your God-given space. Yeah. So do you have a story or a time in your life when you were just like trying to figure it all out? Yeah. I mean, here we are recording. We have all these adorable young people (laughs) in that season of trying to figure it out, right? Yep. And so I shared in the first episode about the transition from blogging to podcasting when I had young kids, but let's rolling it back to just out of college. Um, I actually went to school to become a doctor. Oh yeah. What kind of doctor? I want to be a pediatrician. Interestingly enough, I loved kids. I love science. Boom. And you get a good reaction when you tell people you want to be a doctor. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, oh, what are you going to school for? Well, Mm. (laughs) pre-med. Wow. Yeah. It's always doctor or lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. So I worked really hard for that to do that Mm -hmm. and ended up getting engaged and applied to med schools but was waitlisted. And then by the time I started realizing what this meant, I thought, you know what? I don't know that I want to spend seven years in school because I kind of want to have my own kids. Yeah. So we ended up when we were first married in Wheaton, Illinois, and I had this bio pre-med degree and my husband traveled three weeks out of the month and I had no job, no job. (laughs) No, (laughs) just, did you feel aimless? I just, I I wasn't like I could say I'm staying home with kids. I'm Mm -hmm. pursuing, I actually tried to maybe get a job with VeggieTales and Oprah (laughs) and just switch into the the entertainment industry. I was trying to like pivot into entertainment with a bio pre-med. Well, so I end up being a teacher's aide in West Chicago, which felt like the biggest step back because- You don't have to have a college degree to have that job. And I didn't have an education major. I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm at this job asking so many questions, feeling super unsuccessful in my path and wondering like, what is going on? You know? Yeah. I felt like that when I had just finished Full House, met Val, we got we were engaged and then I all of a sudden be, and, and eventually married, but I was, there were a couple of years where I was just a hockey wife, also known as a puck bunny. No. I wasn't a puck what? bunny though. What? A puck bunny is- <laughs> What is a happening? A puck bunny is, you know, someone that you're not dating seriously. So I was not that. I was <laughs> okay. a hockey wife. Okay. But- I would sit in, we, he was playing in Montreal at the time. I couldn't work in Canada. Oh, right. Because I'm an American, didn't didn't have a visa. It's not like I could just go on auditions there and work. So I would sit at home. I would maybe go to the gym. Mm -hmm. I would, there was nothing for me to do. And I would just wait until his games and then be a hockey wife. 
it was such a weird season yeah. for me. I felt very directionless and I felt like my hands were tied, that there wasn't anything I could, I could do. Yeah. And then you have other people's responses. Mm-hmm. Cause I said, oh, the great response you get when you say, I'm going to be a doctor. Well, when yeah. then you see them, <laughs> like, um, I don't have a job or I don't yeah. know what I want to be when I grow up and yeah. you're in your mid twenties or you were on that path and now it seems like you yeah. took three steps backwards. Okay. I mean, so tell this me. This also just reminded me, I was, had done the show. Yeah. I was now married, decided not to work so I could stay home and raise my kids. I was, or child. I was pregnant with Natasha and I went to the grocery store and I was talking to the butcher to get some meat and I, and he was the regular butcher, so, yeah. but I, he recognized me and he was like, hi, how are you? And I said, good. And he said, oh, you know, I love the show you're on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> he said, so what are you doing now? And I was like, oh, I'm, well, I'm having a baby. And he looked at me like with the saddest, most pathetic eyes, like pathetic for <laughs> that I was pathetic. Yeah. And he was like, oh, so you're not, you're not on TV anymore. Mm. And I'm like, no, I got married and, and I'm, I'm having a baby. And he was like, oh, okay. And it, you know, he didn't mean anything by it. I, right. I think badly, no. but oh, it made me feel awful. And this isn't like a family member. This isn't no, someone, your husband. It was just a guy is- and it was like, <laughs> uh, you, yeah, if you're not on TV, then you're just nobody. Yep. Our definitions of success. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had family members or people in your life who questioned you taking <laughs> steps back? Okay. Now therapy okay, starts. Here we go again. Therapy starts. So when, during this transition time, after getting married, I had Natasha and I still wanted to work. That was my desire. And I had seen so many people do it all that yeah. they could be successful moms while working full-time jobs. And so I thought this is going to be me. Yeah. And my dad, Robert, who is now retired, but was a school teacher for 35 years, public middle school teacher came to my house and said, I, you know, I want to have a conversation with you. And I said, okay. So he brought this huge easel with a huge notepad <laughs> and pens and markers and Stop. charts and graphs because my dad's a teacher and <laughs> the dude just loves a presentation. Okay. So what are you feeling like? Are you? Yeah. So I was like, what? Is this what a normal, is like this happening? is a normal thing? With well, it's, the- it's like normal for my dad to present something, but <laughs> okay. this seemed big. Okay. And I was like, what, what, what's going on? So he, he then began this presentation of why I should not try to pursue my career in acting now that I'm married and have a child. And he said, why, why would you do this? Here are all the reasons not to do this. And then he told me, you know, you were a kid, you had success and it was like magical, but it was a fairy tale. And that's great that you had that success as a child, but now you're an adult and that success will probably not carry on because you got lucky. Oh, okay. And, um, and I have to tell you, by the way, I I have a great relationship with my dad, love my dad. And, you know, he's a person of safety and He said, why would you want to experience all of this rejection? That's what your whole business is about. He said, you're a mom now and your husband has a job. You don't have to work. Just be safe at home and Mm. raise your kids. And you'll have, that's what your life should be about. And, you know, there's so many people fighting for your job. You have to audition against other people. And there's, there, there are people more talented than you are. And, and I, I didn't disagree. I'm like, sure, there are people more talented <laughs> as an actress than I am. In the gut, but it was a like, oh, hard. Yeah, and he hurts. just goes, why would you want to go through a bunch of people telling you that you're not good? So that was also his insecurity yeah, being projected on too. me yeah. mm-hmm. being, you know, people saying no to me. So anyway, that's that was a conversation that was really hard for me to listen to. And he was really opposing my working in the industry and it hurt. Yeah. And then it made me question, well, oh, am I not supposed to be working? And of course that hadn't had an influence on me and my decision to be a full-time stay-at-home mom. But I 
I really did come to that conclusion on my own and not for the reasons that my dad had. Not from the said, presentation. Yeah, not from the presentation. The compelling <laughs> presentation that By hit. the way, I was like, dad, do you even remember that you told that to me? And he's like, oh, no, darling, I'm sorry. I, what did I say? <laughs> oh. He's like, but I love watching your movies. You're so good. And I'm like, yeah, dad, you tried to stop me at one point. Oh. Well, I just want what's best for you. Right. I know, dad. Thanks. But sometimes while people can give us advice, it's not always good advice or it might not be bad advice, but it's not necessarily the right advice. And that's why we need to listen to God. Well, and that's the key too. Like his goal was protection of you yes. and to keep you from feeling failure as if we get to hold the keys to what success and what the failure looks like. Right. We, a failure might be the path to take us to our next thing. You know, yep. I mean, for me, that whole, I didn't go to med school and now I'm a teacher's aide yep. was actually the impetus for my next step, which was, um, in yeah, that, what was the next <laughs> journey after yeah, the like, teacher's how aid? How do you get from <laughs> teacher's aide to podcasting? Um, so one of the kids I was assigned to work with as a teacher's aide actually was on the autism spectrum and I would go with him to his speech therapy and I discovered this whole career path that no one had ever told me about, or maybe I'd heard of a speech therapist, but I was like, oh, this is really cool. It is still science and it is still working with kids, but instead of a whole classroom of children, I can be with one or two or three at a time. And I love helping people. And so yes. there's this reward built in to the process. And so, which actually really fits with wanting to be a doctor. Yeah. It just feels, I mean, so, so, so our teachers are, are, helping children yeah, learn, totally. but this feels more specific. Yeah. It was still like that clinical side yes. of there's diagnoses and there's treatment. And so, uh, I decided I'm going to get my degree. I'm going to go into speech language pathology, but around the same time, my husband takes a job or his job moves him to San Francisco. Okay. And so I apply to a school out in San Francisco and I don't get accepted. Oh, <laughs> just one, wham, bam, <laughs> another after another. failure. And it was San Francisco State, which is a solid school, but it wasn't like it was top five in the programs, you know? Right. I just felt like, man, what is going on? But I had learned from that experience with being a teacher's aide that God can still use experiences mm -hmm. to direct us. Yep. And so I said, okay, I'm here in San Francisco. Lots of time, like you as a hockey wife, lots of time. What am I going to do with my time? And so I sign up to volunteer at the local hospital. Okay. Yeah. I'm like, I, I have this time. Might as well use it to help people yep. until I figure out where God wants me to go next. Yep. And so I go to the orientation and one of the areas you're allowed to volunteer in was the speech language pathology department. Which you already loved and had been exposed to. And yeah. you were like, God, I, you're showing me. This is amazing. Where I'm supposed yeah. to be. And amazingly enough, the first day I volunteer there, they offered me a job as wow. an assistant. And they said, you should reach back out to San Francisco State because as a resident, you can take classes for cheaper from that department. Wow. So I found myself working as an assistant and taking classes, loving all the classes I was taking, getting great grades and really doing well. Yeah. And around the same time, my husband decided to start a company in Chicago. But you had just moved to San Francisco. <laughs> okay. So I'm like, okay, God, this what are you like doing? sounds like my hockey life, by yes. the way, when every time we got traded. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about that. Like you're just, oh, I just, you know, you're moving around. You're just moving around. And it's and, disrupting you it, every time. <laughs> of course it is. But I guess you, you expect that as a professional mm -hmm. athlete, but, but we were traded quite a few times. So <laughs> yeah. And you, you, you literally have to leave that day. Oh, I didn't They're know like, that. You've been traded. Here's your plane ticket. Get on a plane right now. Yeah. So Val would leave, but then I, I'm, it's my responsibility to pack up the house and the kids and go meet him. Cause he's got to get to find and like find a, a new life. No, not a new life, but yeah. Find uh, housing and all the things. All the things, including friends and purpose oh, yeah. there. Yeah. Because people are listening who are like, yeah, that's me. I'm in a transition right now. Yeah. And I'm feeling a little bit like yes. I don't have a place. Exactly. Yeah. 
And I look back and I think I was a really awkward hockey wife. I was <laughs> because about you, you, you have to find friends. Mm. You have to, you're kind of thrown. I guess the good thing is you're kind of thrown in with other women that are in the same boat as you, but some of them have been there a long time. And when you're always the new person, you're the new kid in the class, yeah. you always feel a little awkward. And yeah. I think because of my life experiences and being a person in the public, it always made me feel even more uncomfortable. Like, what are people thinking of me? Are they thinking I'm this Hollywood person that's now walking in and I'm going to try to take over? Mm -hmm. And then I get, would get really shy and then I would get perceived as being snobby, oh, snobby because yeah. I was quiet. Like, it just always felt awkward. Yeah. And I was also in my 20s, by the way. Thank goodness for the 30s and 40s. And now I'm pushing my 50s. But I love time in the sense that we mature. Yeah. Grateful There's for that. There's a gift in that. Staying healthy is really important to me. And it's not always easy. For some people, healthcare can be too expensive. But your health is precious. One Share Health is a faith-based ministry that offers low-cost, comprehensive healthcare programs that could save you up to 50% each month. With One Share Health, you could reduce your healthcare costs and help other people at the same time. I encourage you to check them out and ask lots of questions. Find out more at my.onesharehealth.com slash Candice. That's my.onesharehealth.com slash Candice. Part of my story back mm -hmm. as a teacher's aide, one of my favorite things was that student I worked with. I was in charge of helping him emotionally regulate. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like what you're talking about, like being in a new place and how do you wrap your mind around adapting to this place is he had a phrase we would use in his processing where we'd label what was happening, what he was feeling, what he needs to feel. And then he pictured in his head, this mechanical system and a little man who would need to turn the crank to move him past the problem on like a little Jack in the box, like a little right? guy. And so my phrase would be turn the crank, Andrew, turn the crank. And one day I'll remember, he said, he was so upset about something that happened during recess. And he was like, I can't turn the crank on this one, Mrs. Aww. Mack. Like he was just so heartbroken. And I think that to encourage the person who's there and you're like, yeah, I know I need to adapt and I know I need to try to not be so awkward or I need to mm -hmm. figure out how to live in this space. It's like, I get, and I can relate. And I know you can relate to like, sometimes it just stinks. Yes. Like we're just stuck yep. and we cannot yep. turn the crank. Yep. And so if you've been in a stuck place, like what helps you when you're maybe some of those days where you move to a new city, you've got these kids, you don't even know where to go to get groceries or, or the dry cleaner or the dry cleaner or where the nearest, or maybe it's is. even here and you live here and you just yeah. are like, man, I feel a little stuck today. Yeah. When it's in the moment, I'm all about the deep breath. Mm. I really have to just calm the voices in my head and calm my heart because sometimes your heartbeat starts elevating. You just get frustrated or anxious. Mm -hmm. And I know a good night's sleep always helps. That yeah. helps me. Sleep is so important. And I know those are really simple answers. <laughs> no, but those, but those are, are often truly like so a lot of times I'm like, I just, I need to have a new day. I need to just get through my day mm -hmm. and then have a good night's sleep. And let's, let's, I mean, now pray at that time, that wasn't part of my routine because my relationship with God was not strong in my early twenties, but now it's like, let me pray on this. Let me have a good sleep. God, give me a, a new day, new mercies every morning. No, I think sometimes the simple answers are often the best ones. You know, we keep talking about, or we, we, we've used the word humble. And um, I think we all try to grasp what the word humble means, yeah. but often people can misunderstand humility, right? Yeah. Can you explain the, yeah. the definition or the, those differences? Yeah. Like when I was saying like, it was humbling to think I was going to med school and then I'm working this job that didn't even require a college degree or being in a place where you don't know anybody and you're 
navigating friendships. It's Mm -hmm. like, I think sometimes though we can say humility is like, woe is me. Or Mm -hmm. a phrase I hear people say is, um, you need to think less of your, less of yourself. And I don't know that either of those really fit the biblical definition Mm -hmm. that I've read. Like one word in Hebrew, we'll do a little teaching time. Great. Y'all ready? Yep. Um, is Ani, and I might be saying it wrong. I did not take Hebrew. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Not, I don't know how to pronounce all the words, but that would be circumstantial humi- humility, like being in a situation where someone's been afflicted. You just finished reading Job. Mm-hmm. So Job was in circumstances when he lost his house or his kids yes. and his wealth. That was Ani. That's humbling circumstances. Okay. And so that leads to another word we read in scripture. The Hebrew word is Anav, which is the character that comes from those humble circumstances. So as Job is going through that, we see him become humble. He was righteous. And that's a Anav. Anav. It might be a knob because sometimes V's are pronounced as okay. V's in okay. Hebrew. But so if you're listening and you're like, Heather, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> um, so it's like this, you're in a lowly position me in San Francisco or me in Chicago or, you know, you Mm -hmm. in a new city. And we are aware of our inability to kind of change the circumstances or change the people to like perceive us rightly. And so we, um, get that anav as our, our humble character as part of that. Does that all make sense? Yes, it does. So in writing this book, Mm -hmm. a big part, and it sounds silly, Big part of this book came from a tweet, which I'm not on Twitter that much. Are you on Twitter? Not as much as Instagram. Yeah, I'm more of an Instagram person. Well, it came across somehow my path. Maybe someone posted it on Instagram from Twitter, but it was from Bobby Grunwald who created YouVersion. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know him. Um, But he was quoting one of their devotional writers, uh, Dave Adamson, who wrote this. Okay, so the Hebrew word avana is what he wrote is translated as humility, but an expanded definition would be to occupy your God-given space. Humility is not just avoiding overstepping boundaries, but it's also being sure we step into them. Mm, That's good. Yeah. Occupy your space. Don't avoid overstepping, but also making sure you step into that space. And as I dug a little deeper into this word, I'm like, is that really the Hebrew definition. Mm-hmm. I realized there's a misspelling maybe in the tweeting of it, Okay, but it's not um, what he wrote. It was actually Anava. So remember okay. when I said the humble character, what is Anav? Ana- uh-huh. So they're just adding A-H to the end of that. Okay. So it's this expanded, like let's expand on humble character. It's the person mm-hmm. who is of humble character in humble circumstances, who is then the action they're taking. Okay. Based on that humble character is to stay within the space God's given them, but not just stay like fill it. Don't shrink back from yeah. it. Stay in it. That makes me think of taking the job as co-host on the view mm. because I, I truly felt like I was taking that in humility because it wasn't necessarily a job that I wanted. And I wasn't I wasn't trying to get that job. And I actually had said no several times before accepting it, mm-hmm. but God kept putting it back on my plate. Yeah, We kept praying and saying that oh, this couldn't work out because of this. And God was like, yep, okay, we fixed that. Mm-hmm. Well, but I can't because of this. And then that was fixed. And another one, well, I can't because of that. That was fixed. And it was like, oh, okay, God, you keep opening this door, like you're clearly asking me to step into it. And I felt that I did in humility, in my, in my, in my humbleness, I guess, just to say humility in humility, I'm like, God, I humble myself before you. And I will step into this because I feel you've called me here. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those invitations okay. or assignments. So would that would be. Yeah. And what I love about your example is it's a little bit more a, glamorous. Mm-hmm. And so where I found even this message has encouraged people is when God is assigning them to something that feels really big or maybe feels a little undesirable, like in your case, 
I'm sure there's people listening like, oh my gosh, I would love you got to that be. that opportunity. That's amazing. And you're not feeling it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That you're saying, okay, it's actually not pride mm-hmm. that is me filling that role. I'm saying, man, in all of myself, I'm not maybe wanting to do this, but you are leading me here and you're inviting me in. And I trust that you're doing something bigger yep. than me outside of this. Yep. Exactly. And you probably didn't show up and just like not look at the script and not really care. <laughs> no, I you filled I it. Filled it. Yeah. I was, uh, I worked so many hours. It was the, the hardest job I had, but I was scared to death every day <laughs> that I went on that show yeah. so that I was always preparing. I was always in prayer. I was always on my face before God, before I would walk into that studio because, you know, I felt weak at times, but I just didn't feel prepared. But I knew God was with me. And that's why I was able to step into that space every day. And I had, I had peace knowing that God was with me because I'm like, God, I know you're going to carry me through this because I didn't ask to be here. Yeah. You've put me here. Yeah. So do your thing, God. (laughs) (laughs) I need you to show up every day. I mean, I just hear the surrender in your story, like just to really on your knees it's about you. It's not about me. Yeah. And I think about Moses, you know, mm-hmm. even in that experiencing God book that I talked about, yep. that's like the core of that Bible study was that encounter with God and Moses at the burning bush. And there's this holy experience mm-hmm. of like God inviting him in to lead the people out of Israel, or out of Egypt to mm-hmm. the promised land and him feeling unworthy. Like, no, pick somebody else. Okay, if I'm gonna do it, let's take my brother. <laughs> like, yep. I, I he didn't really say, Oh yeah, I've got this. Oh, you're who are you? Is what he said to God. And he's like, I am. Yeah. You know? Or or I know he said, I don't feel equipped. And God didn't say, No, you've got this, dude. You you're so great. Or God didn't say to you, yeah. No, Candace, you've got God, this. Oh, you have all this experience. He said, Nope, I am. Exactly. He always, God always chooses the ill-equipped. Yes. So that his glory can be shown through. Yeah. And that he can, yeah, he can carry us through the whole thing. Yeah. But in humility, Moses took the part. He took the job. He led the people and we see him continually rely on God. And you and I were talking like, there's this situation with the rock, with water coming out of the rock, how God provides for the people in the wilderness with food and with water, all the grumbling, right? Mm -hmm. And so Moses, because he's in that surrendered position, like you were just talking about, like, it's not me. I don't know what I'm doing. And he keeps going to God. Like the people are grumbling. I don't know what to do. And God would give him a solution, right? And so one of the times the water's bitter and God gives him an instruction to throw a log into it. Mm -hmm. And then the water's drinkable. Another time they need water and he tells them, to strike the rock and the water comes out. And then we were talking about how he overstepped his boundary. And you're like, wait, he overstepped his boundary by striking the rock again in a different time, right? Yeah, I forgot that. Yeah. That he struck the rock without God ordering him to strike the rock. It was that dependency was what God wanted. Exactly. Like listening to his specific instructions. Moses is thinking, we've done this before. Same rodeo, I hit the rock and the water comes out, right? right. Which it did. The water did come right. out. But God said, no, I told you to speak right to the rock. This isn't just a one fits all. Here's your instruction plan. Use it every time. He's like, no, I, yeah, I need you to listen to me. And even Jesus, when he heals yeah. blind people, we see he does a different mm-hmm. method with each person. And so it's like that dependency is what he's longing for. Yeah. By the way, I'm just going to interrupt because like, I forgot that detail about Moses. That's why it's so important that we read our Bibles. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> sending a word of encouragement to read your Bible because it's just, it's filled with these amazing stories that one, even if you've read it, you could have forgotten some details totally. or I promise you because God's word is living and active, you're just going to find God in it in a way that you hadn't seen before. You're going to pull something else out of his character, uh, whatever it is, but you got to keep Well, and I was even talking to Max Lucado. I don't know how to Mm -hmm. say say it wrong every time. Max Lucado, Lucado, tomato, tomato. Yeah. We know who you're talking about. He's great. 
he's a fantastic person, but he was sharing a story about how he was looking for clarity on something. And this is that dependency. This is that humble stance of, I don't have all the answers for my success or where I'm going. I need God. And he opened his Bible and he's Mm -hmm. like, not that this is going to happen, but God directed him to an exact passage that gave him instruction. And I was at a point where I was trying to make a decision on the day I interviewed him. Mm -hmm. And so the next morning, sure enough, I go to my Bible study. And when I'm studying, it gave me clear instructions on what I needed to do that day. And I think that's the Holy Spirit with God's word that you can hear from him in a really tangible, practical way. Yep. That like this nebulous God's will that we talked about, it's like, well, it's right in front of you if you're just each step surrendering enough to depend on where he's taking you. Yeah, that's it. I think we so often are always looking for the big, big picture. Like what is the specific thing? And it's like, the thing is right in front of you. It's even if it feels like a mundane thing to you, it's just wherever you are right now, but it's your dependency upon God to look to him and listen to him and hear him. Totally. And be obedient to him. These are hard concepts, but good. Yes. So good. Discipline is never fun, but it, um, yeah, but it's, it gives us wisdom and it's what's best for us. Yeah. We know that as parents too. Yeah. So the <laughs> success comes from this humble place of fully occupying your God given space. Wow. We have so much to think about, and I hope that it's already encouraging our listeners today. Now, something that we're doing at the end of all of our conversations is to answer a listener question. And this week's question is from Molly. Molly asks, how do you make sure you have time for your family when life has you in so many different directions? You always share about your family on your stories, and it's just amazing how you have time for it all. (laughs) Well, thanks, Molly. (laughs) Smoke and mirrors, smoke and mirrors. I don't always have time for it all, and it's not always seamless, and uh, I don't always do it well. Let me tell you, I'll be the first to admit. It actually is something that I have had a very hard time juggling over the years, especially when my kids were younger, and I'm in a different season of life now because they're all young adults. (sighs) My youngest, by the way, just turned 21. It's My crazy. baby. Ugh. So anyway, um, the, the truth is I don't always have time for my family, but it's all about prioritizing and prioritizing. My family is right at the top of the list, but I've had to be very intentional in that priority time mm-hmm. with my family and with my husband, because so easily you can make that time and then just, well, I just need one more hour to finish up this. And then it cuts into that family time. And so over the years, I've really learned to either say no to people or opportunities or things because it conflicts with my family time and have hard deadlines or hard outs. A hard out is like, if I have to leave work at five o'clock, it means I leave work at five o'clock. I'm not texting my husband saying, I just need one more hour, which is so easy to do. So prioritizing. What about you, Heather? I love that. I think we're going to talk even more about that. Yeah. In this season. Um, You know, I'm thinking about the parts of my story I've kind of already shared and God has been really compassionate. Don't you feel like and kind to give us in the season what we need for that season? So yes, not doing the book when my kids were in those little years was such a gift. Now that I have written and seen the demands to like, my friend was right. Can you just wait five years? (laughs) The pause button was a little longer. We're like seven years, but you're right. Having older kids, it's a difference. Mm -hmm. It's a different demand on your time, your heart energy. And, you know, maybe later nights, than I had before, but I don't know. I just think even in her question, I hear this comparison that happens when we look at my space that God's given me compared to your space. And I can't compare necessarily even to my friends who are in the same stage as me because I have kids with different needs that require things of me that those friends don't have, or I have four Mm -hmm. boys and they have two kids or My husband works from home and their husband, you know, everybody's so unique. And so it can look like they're doing it all, but I bet they aren't like, (laughs) nope. People are always amazed at how messy my house is. Okay. So maybe I'm putting out a podcast every week, but I'm not cleaning up the house. Yeah, for sure. For sure. (laughs) So really trusting like what he's assigning you, 
recognizing what are your priorities and just like we're going to talk about these boundary lines of the space that God has for you. That's great. Well, we're going to wrap up today's episode. And if you have ever felt like you don't have everything figured out, you don't even know where to start, well, we have something special for you this season. Heather and I wanna help you discover how your gifts, talents, and experiences can equip you to face whatever season of life you're in. We have a free downloadable PDF with tips to help you discover right where you belong. Go to Candice.com and download it. We think it's gonna change how you see and engage with life. And there's also a link on the website where you can order Heather's new book, right where you belong. And there's also a a link in our show notes. Until next time, be grateful all day, every day. This has been a Candace Cameron Bure podcast, a production of Candy Rock Entertainment. Some of the products and services mentioned are paid promotions. Any advice should be confirmed with a qualified professional. Opinions and ideas are for entertainment purposes only and belong to Candy Rock Entertainment. All rights reserved.